All right, in order to start off this luncheon discussion, um, I think the best thing to do would be to turn to Nancy for a little bit of thoughts on how the morning went and what we can do to ensure that the afternoon goes even better. So let me turn to you, Nancy. Great, thank you. Hope everyone had a good lunch. Um, I was impressed with the amount of uh, energetic conversation that was going on and the number of solutions that seemed to be surfacing in the lunchtime conversation. Um, and I also just wanted to note, earlier David said that we were trending uh, on Twitter for DC tweets. Um, and I wanted to note that a number of our players are playing the game online as well. And I understand that uh, Viola on the media team is being lobbied by all number, from Iran to the U UN, all kinds of players who want her to represent their views. Uh, Manal uh, tweeted early on that she was going to possibly defect and online arrange to deal with the EU. If we just want to see some of the, pro the productive ways that Twitter can, can be here. And I understand also that um, one of our foreign policy colleagues was retweeted by somebody who is apparently an actual ISIS supporter. Tom, <laughs> Tom asked him what he thought of the peace game, but he ha we haven't heard that response yet. Thank you for that endorsement. Um, yeah. As some of you may have read, a number of copies of Foreign Policy were actually found in Osama bin yes. Laden's library. Um, but they stopped once we went online. So we assumed thereafter he was just going to foreignpolicy.com. Afterwards, right. Uh, afterwards, exactly. So, you know, I think what was very instructive about this morning is, you know, everybody did a, a very faithful rendering of their roles. And what we saw in especially the early part of the morning was a fair amount of both inaction and finger pointing, which reflected, I think, a lot of the reality that we've all been living with and in for the last five years. Um, there, there was also I would argue um, evidence of action or latent action, especially by non-state actors, where they're in the in the absence of something more comprehensive and more uh, coming out of the UN and, and concerted uh, state action. We did see the police at a community level, some of the IT community, some of our local communities. Uh, um, already moving forward and doing things. And latent action in, in terms of the IT community, the business community asking to be brought into the solutions. Um, so there are definitely, there's, there's additional capacity to harness. There was also towards the end of the session, some ideas at David's urging that were put, put down that we didn't have a chance to go into deeper exploration of. You know, for example, thank you uh, USG for coming up with some innovative ideas like the, well, also the no-fly zone that uh, you suggested towards the end. You know, ideas that have been floated, but w we d weren't able to get into more detail on them. But above all, it seemed to really reflect the complexity of having these macro-level conversations when we were dealing with so many, so many affected countries and regions. And the challenge is bringing it down to some evidence-based approach of what works when we're trying to deal with particular aspects of this problem. I think as we go forward into the afternoon session, it would be um, a, a useful evolution if people could think about playing their best selves. If, if you, in your roles, were able to find your interest in finding a solution and working constructively with everyone else at the table, if as if that wonderful constructive world existed, but for the purpose of finding solutions that really intersect with a lot of the interests around the table, um, to push ourselves to, to, to what might move us forward. And I want to just, especially as we move into the next session, underscore a couple of, of the points that are very relevant from the previous session into the next. And, and that is um, this whole issue of really focusing on not just the tactics, but also the strategy. And Georgia uh, spoke earlier about um, staying attuned to the motives. What, what is it that people are searching for when they join? And it, it's, not, it's not only the ideology, but it's the very specific motivations of individuals as they, as they move towards these approaches. And as we 
look at the afternoon um, scenarios, uh, there are, that as a basis really under, uh, undergirds a lot of what of the solution set that we're seeking for. So with that, David, let me turn it over to you and get us started on the afternoon. Okay. Let me uh, pick up on it. I'm actually just re-quoting something Nancy said to me a minute ago, which is that the, the best way to make the most productive use of a session like this is to understand the outer limits of constructive possibilities, you know, and, uh, and, uh, but you have to take all of those words, you know, we, we have to understand what the limits are to what's possible because we don't want to deal with what's not possible, but we do want to be constructive. Um, and um, we know the roles. Now clearly those of you playing Al-Qaeda and, and Daesh, you know, the, the objective here is for you to catalyze some of this action and we don't expect you to grow halos O overnight, um, but more broadly, we do want to look at what's possible within the parameters of, 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 of you know, your various political, economic, geographic, and other kinds of constraints. Um, <clears throat> and having said that, we thought it would be useful at this point to stop and have a bit of a discussion about what works both in terms of the myths of what works. Um, uh, you know, well, we'll just put out a nice counter-narrative and everything will be fine. Um, uh, and the reality of what works, the nuts and bolts of what actually uh, helps counter violent extremism, either for the purposes of this discussion, on the recruitment side, or on the containment of the threat side, uh, which touches upon what we'll be discussing in the next scenario, which has to do with foreign fighters and their, their either return home or, or their movement to other kinds of conflicts. Uh, and a few folks have, have been talked to in advance and have agreed to uh, frame some of these ideas um, in terms of myths and realities of what works. And let me turn to you, Farah, to kick that off, and each of them will speak for three to five minutes, and then we'll open up the discussion. Some of you may have some thoughts from this morning, from lunch, other things you'd like to float out there, um, uh, and so make this a kind of a constructive working group session. Farah. Thank you very much, and I just want to underscore that I'm playing me. I am me as I'm speaking. Um, so one of the, the, the biggest myths that we have in dealing with CVE is really that we can't beat this. Um, and that is, in my view, um, a real stumbling block, and I don't mean to be cute about it, but it really prevents us from being imaginative in terms of what's coming down the pike. The reality is, is that we actually, over the course of the last years since 9-11, have pilot tested a wide variety of things online and offline that we know can work. So my, 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 my frame in all of this is that the solutions are available and they are affordable. Um, I know firsthand that the role of governments are obviously very uh, complex in this whole matter. But the thing that the U.S. government has shown us that we can do is to be the convener and the facilitator and the intellectual partner with the ideas that we hear on the ground. In my view, that is the, straight, the greatest strength of the United States government. And it has de been demonstrated in the pilot initiatives that we have seen, both in the Bush administration and in the Obama administration. So what are very specific things that we can do that will work? Because they're working at a very micro level, and if they were scaled up in a bigger way and mobilized so that it is the machinery exists to build the capacity for these programs, we will see an actual change. The first is a very, very structural one. This was hit upon uh, both last night and today in various ways. As we think about the strategy for CVE, we have only looked at a hard power component to this. We do not have the capacity, and we have not built the capacity to both build a hard power and a soft power strategy that is integrated, and not just integrated, but given the money and the resources, and here's the most important part, the respect. For most of the interagency, when you talk about soft power, CVE, ideology, the war of ideas, eyes glaze over. Nobody wants to hear that part of the conversation. The first part of how we fix this and beat this is to be able to integrate those strategies in a compelling and real way. 
The second thing is a very obvious one for this international group that's sitting here around the table today. This issue is not about a region. This is about a demographic. The vulnerable demographic to the ideology of the extremists that we're talking about, whether it's AQ, whether it's ISIS, Boko, Al-Shabaab, or other affiliated groups, is the demographic of Muslim millennials. And that demographic, because they are millennials, is global. We must look at how that is taking place and rooting in the experience of Muslim millennials across the planet. So the way we integrate the strategy and how we do this has got to be a global one. What is happening in Mauritania and in Zanzibar and Tajikistan and in Norway is connected and we need to act like it is. Um, the, other thir the third thing is that we need to understand very importantly that in terms of the kind of programs that we put money towards, we've looked at uh, players on the ground in a very local way. Now, we've heard the word local being used today in a wide variety of ways. Let me be very specific. I mean neighborhood to neighborhood. I do not mean country to country, nor do I mean city to city. I literally mean neighborhood to neighborhood because the local players and the impact for young Muslim millennials in these particular communities shifts. And we don't have the time to get into the, 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 the deep uh, on that, but it is important that we think at a very, very granular, granular level. Toward that end, um, some of the, the initiatives that have been seeded that can be scaled up, I'll give you a very good example, that one that is ho housed here at USIP. Um, Generation Change is a network of over 600 young Muslims around the world with 30 chapters from the Comoros to Ireland to Malaysia. Young people who are change makers who want to push back against the extremist narratives. What happens when you catalyze a movement of young people? That is my point. We need to be thinking about how to catalyze the millennials who want to make a difference for their own future. And in my view, we have not even tried yet. This, is, this brings me to my, my final point. We need to stop talking about this as if we're limited. We are not limited. We have innovation and inspiration in a wide variety of ways. We haven't even tried to do this in the way we need to. What I would say in terms of how we, we can do this and what the reality is on the ground is if we stop talking about all the obstacles and understand that some of the really inventive and experiential uh, um, experiences for countries all over the world, if they were mobilized and scaled up in a coordinated way, meaning um, all day, every day, that's what I mean by coordinated, not government telling people what to do, and unleash and let go and allow those organic things to start blossoming, we will see an absolute shift in the way millennials think about what they're doing. And the reason I know that is because we have pilot tested some of these things. So when I think about, in my three minutes, when I think about the myths and the realities, uh, again, it is really about what we have seen over 13 and a half years, what we know we can do, and what needs to be done as we go forward. This is not about ISIS. This is about an ideology that is seeping into Muslim millennials all over the world, and the numbers tell the story, which is why if we do not shift the way we think about what is possible, we will be doing this kind of thing for years to come. Can I, can I ask you a follow-up question? When you say we must think of them as millennials, that seems very smart. Um, <laughs> But, and, 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 and it's clearly true, I think. But maybe it would be helpful to everybody if you could clarify a little bit of, by what you mean. In the uh, sense of what is different about a Muslim millennial than another Muslim? Okay. What, 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 where, where does that provide an opportunity or a challenge? So Frank, as I um, have experienced um, firsthand in more than 80 countries around the world talking to young Muslims under the age of 30. There's something very specific that is happening to this generation that has not happened to their parents' generation or their, or their grandparents' generation. Um, every young person, you heard the term uh, terminology around here in terms of a uh, crisis of identity. And you can say anybody, any young teenager has a crisis of identity. But there hasn't been the kind of machinery all day, every day, online and offline, that is uh, forcing itself upon a demographic that is asking themselves, in a post-9-11 world, what is the difference between culture and religion? How can I be modern and Muslim? What does it mean to be Muslim on the planet today? Questions like this that are speaking directly to who they are.
When I see that pattern happen in more than 80 countries around the world with this demographic, the data points are super clear to me, and I see the same kind of patterns that happen. Because, Frank, they are digital nat natives, and with a swish of their finger, they can connect ideas around the world. It doesn't matter if I was in the jungles of Cambodia. It doesn't matter if I was in Zanzibar. It doesn't matter I was, if I was in the UK. These millennials are asking the same kinds of questions. And they're going, yes, in some places to shake Google to get answers, but in others, they're going to local people in an offline space to tell them, their own peers, to tell them how they need to belong. And until we understand that particular thing that's happening to these millennials, we, we will not be able to get and talent scout and find the right kind of voices that can speak directly to them. Okay, very, very helpful. So. Again, uh, we've got a couple other folks who've offered to speak about this, and, and I'm going to turn to them in a second, but I do want all of you to be thinking about what are the myths, what are the realities about what works, so that you can contribute not in your role, but from your own personal experience, anything that might either debunk a myth or offer us an example of something that may work. And let me turn now to Jurgen because you have had um, a lot of hands-on experience in developing what you've done in Denmark. Maybe, maybe you could talk to us about some, some of what works. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to do that and, and, and tell you a little about uh, the experience that, that I have from my police district. Um, just following up on this morning discussions, it was said that uh, what we talked about was a soft response. It was nice and gentle and so on. Uh, well, in a way, uh, perhaps, uh, but uh, it's uh, to quote the famous Swedish uh, um, researcher in terrorism, Magnus Ranstorp, he, he said, well, the soft approach is in fact the hard approach because it's, it's hard to do. And the hard approach, legislation, is in fact easy. It's easy to pass a law, but who knows if it works? So uh, I think that's a good point. Uh, but to make it quite clear, uh, we have, of course, legislation. We have uh, laws against terrorism, against uh, participating in terrorist uh, activities and funding uh, terrorist activities. And we, if we have reason to believe that some of these uh, guys are violating this legislation or other legislation, they will, of course, be punished. We'll prosecute, investigate and prosecute, and they'll be sentenced, and uh, uh, no doubt about that. But that doesn't exclude the fact that we also can work in a preventive uh, way with preventive measures. Um, so this was in fact when we, what, what we started, what we began with in, in uh, 2007 after the Madrid bombings, after the London bombings, we said to ourselves in always we have to do something in order to prevent young people from becoming radicalized politically or religiously. So we began by raising the awareness uh, with, uh, uh, with police officers, school teachers, uh, social workers, youth club workers, and so on, raise the awareness against this new phenomenon. Uh, and uh, afterwards, we, 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 well, we, we built a road, as you can say, as we went along. So we found out, well, now these people might be concerned of what they've seen. They have to report this concern to a place. So we created locally a so-called info house where people could report their, their, their concern. And uh, these uh, incidents, these uh, concerns were then assessed in this info house and we decided should we, do, should we do something about these specific concerns or not. If we found, oh, this is just no, this is normal juvenile behavior uh, in search of finding yourself politically or religiously, this is really uh, something you have to be concerned about. We invite uh, the person in question in, uh, interview him, offer him a cup of coffee at the police station, and say, oh, we'll heard something. What is going on? What's going on in your, in your life? And we have several occasions where we, uh, we, we, are, we are able to offer them uh, 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 mentorship. Um, and this has uh, changed their minds. They're still religious persons. Uh, but uh, not to an extent so that uh, they, they, we hope, become uh, violent extremists. Um, furthermore, we have created uh, family networks. We found out that um, the families are just as concerned about the young people as we are. 
Uh, so uh, we want to include the families, we want to empower the families. They look at us for help, uh, so we find out we can work together. <laughs> so we have, uh, we have created these uh, self-helping uh, family network groups. We offer them uh, guidance from my psychologist. How should they react when they see uh, that their young kid is starting to behaving uh, differently? Um, what should they uh, what how, what should they talk about when he suddenly calls from Syria and say mom I'm not coming back what should what should their uh, rhetoric be um, and uh, so we have been reaching out also to these uh, to these families um, after the, we we realized that a lot of uh, young people from our district went to Syria uh, we also found out that um, Quite a number of them had been attending a specific uh, Salafist mosque and been part of a youth uh, center there. So this, we went public with this information and we uh, took contact to the mosque and to, 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 the, to the youth center. And we have been continuing this dialogue and con contact with the, these uh, Muslim uh, communities. And what we can see is that the number of people leaving from our police district to uh, Syria has uh, decreased dramatically from 30 in uh, 2012 to one in 13 and two in, in 14. Uh, it might also be because of some other uh, causes I, I won't know, but, but uh, we believe that our outreach work has, uh, has part of the, uh, the, the answers uh, um, to this uh, problem. Um, and, and, and we have uh, several examples of uh, where we have succeeded in uh, making young people uh, change their minds and not to go to Syria uh, before they before they left uh, from from our police district. Um, then we have uh, a special program for the returnees. Uh, we work in, of course, work within the the, the Danish uh, legislation, and. Uh, uh, you aren't allowed, of course, to join terrorist groups, ISIS, for example. That's self-evident. Uh, but it's not illegal in itself to go to, to Syria. Uh, so uh, what can we do with people uh, whom we know are coming back uh, from Syria? Uh, well, if we have reason to believe that they've been joining a terrorist groups, they'll be prosecuted. But if we don't know, uh, and normally it's hard to get evidence from Syria, uh, well, then the, the alternative is doing nothing. So we, we want to do something. So we invite them into the police station again uh, and assess their situation uh, and see if we can help them being, uh, being integrated, reintegrated in, into the society, which is uh, what most of them want. Um, so these are the, some of the tools that we uh, use. And it's really, uh, uh, I'd like to emphasize it once again, it's, it's, it doesn't ex exclude enforcement. So we enforce the laws, but we also work within the uh, prevention uh, area and prevention field. And um, uh, a last point I should make at this stage is that because of our outreach work, because of our um, contact with families, we've been able to build um, a trust between us and the families. So when the young, uh, when the young guys come back from Syria, very often either the, the young person in question or the families, they contact us and say, okay, he's back. Uh, could, we, could you do something? Could you perhaps help in any way? Jorgen, if I could just ask a follow-on question. Uh, you, you talk about, um, you, your approach seems to have a specificity to it that is important, where you really track exactly who are we talking about, where do they come from, what mosque do they go to, what are their families about. Can you say a bit more about how that kind of specific evidence connects to what you do um, and what implications that might have for the broader dialogue? Well, uh, well, for, first of all, the, the information that we get from uh, about these, these young people, we get from frontline workers who are very close to these people, so, or from their families. So, so we get information as 
what were they before and what is, what, what is happening to them. Uh, and this is the information we get, and then we make this assessment. Well, is it something, these information, is it something that should uh, worry us? We have a possibility of, um, of uh, getting in, in, in a dialogue with a psychologist who is uh, part of this program and discussing uh, this assessment, this situation for this uh, young people in question with, uh, with uh, psychologists in order to, to assess if we have to do something, uh, react on this uh, information that we get. Okay. If that answers your question. Yes. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, Masood has, has offered to provide also some perspectives, and then I will turn it to the rest of the group, but Masood. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of uh, quick points here. Uh, uh, one, on how the media approaches this, uh, this problem. Uh, I think... Uh, uh, Number one is understanding the, prop, the phenomenon of uh, violent extremism and uh, uh, the grasp that the media has on the issue and the connection that the, uh, violent extremism has with Islam. That debate has not been really resolved in the media. The prevailing narrative is that there is very little, uh, uh, there is little connection between the two but I find the semantic debate that's going on over whether, uh, whether ISIS is an Islam, Islamic or not uh, kind of pointless and petty. When people, when Muslims say that ISIS has nothing to do with Islam, uh, what, they're not saying that ISIS members are not Muslim or that a lot of their beliefs are not rooted uh, in Islam, uh, but rather that uh, the Islam that they subscribe to, that they practice, the beliefs and the practices that they have are not the beliefs and the practices that most modern Muslims uh, believe in. So that, uh, that's an important uh, uh, distinction to make uh, uh, over that, uh, in, in that debate. That, uh, of course, uh, ISIS is, uh, uh, an Islamic uh, extremist uh, movement, uh, and a lot of their practices and beliefs are grounded in scripture, in the Quran and Hadith. They may be selective about their use of uh, uh, Islamic uh, scripture in justifying their practices, but they do uh, make references to, to, to the Quran and to the Hadith and uh, traditional Islamic uh, books. So that, that debate uh, is uh, in a way pointless. Is, uh, is uh, ISIS Islamic? Of course uh, it is, uh, but it's not Islamic in the sense that uh, most Muslims uh, practice Islam. Uh, that's uh, number one. And number two, I, th I think there's uh, also a tendency in the media to uh, construct archetypes of the uh, so-called uh, foreign fighter or the Islamic fighter, and that can be quite counterproductive. Uh, I think the reality is a lot uh, more uh, complex and nuanced than what the media uh, likes to portray. Uh, media has, uh, and it's easy to categorize the Islamic fighters into those who are alienated and marginalized and uh, who are, uh, see themselves as uh, victims of discrimination. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, when, uh, when you look at them uh, closely, I think each one has an individual story. And that uh, individual, individual, individualism of every fighter has to be recognized. Uh, so stereotyping, constructing uh, archetypes of this of the foreign fighter can be quite uh, counterproductive uh, and not conducive to finding solutions. Uh, I, in, in discussions about uh, dealing with uh, uh, the issue uh, addressing uh, uh, 
the motivation of uh, foreign fighters and uh, the root, we, I think the literature and discussions often focus on, uh, on two things, uh, on the root causes of the problem, social and economic, and unemployment, uh, marginalization uh, and, uh, in Western societies. Uh, and in terms of solution, you know, one of the solutions uh, that some countries have focused on is uh, community outreach, uh, reaching out to, uh, to f engaging family members, community members, and finding solutions in helping the returnees uh, to reintegrate in society. But one issue that's conspicuously absent from the debate uh, is the impact of uh, American and European foreign policy uh, uh, in their discourse. And that, is, uh, uh, that features prominently and is a major motivation for a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know, the young men uh, and women who head to the battlefields of uh, Syria and Iraq. Uh, so when we, when we discuss, when we try to find solutions to, uh, to this phenomenon, I think that issue has also, that, that issue needs to be addressed as well. Which, well, let me, let me test that for a second and then open it up to everybody else, but which U.S. foreign policy is it that's having an impact? Is it the super aggressive foreign policy that led to the invasion of Iraq? Or is it to the leaning backwards policy that led to doing nothing in Syria? In other words, you know, I hear this often, that it's American foreign policy that's somehow driving this. But which one? I think it's, uh, it's a combination of that. And in South Asia, it's uh, the perception that the continued conflict uh, uh, driven largely by the U.S. presence uh, in that uh, uh, country has created, has led to instability and has created conditions. Uh, which which for, country? Uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, for example. In the case of Syria, of course, we talked about the you know, inaction that's a major, major, seen as a major contributor to, uh, to uh, the appeal uh, um, uh, of, uh, Syria to, to foreign fighters. In the case of uh, Iraq, uh, again, uh, you know, the, the, this, the withdrawal and uh, the instability and the tens of thousands of deaths that have uh, been caused were all seen as uh, counterproductive U.S. policies. And not to mention in, across the Middle East and, uh, and North Africa, uh, foreign U.S. foreign policy that has traditionally supported uh, dictatorial regimes and, uh, uh, and uh, oppressive governments uh, are seen as, uh, as uh, uh, resulting in this uh, in the appeal. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, look, the, the, the idea here is to bring together many perspectives. And, and we won't always agree on those perspectives. I personally have a degree of skepticism on this front. I think U.S. foreign policy, just like European foreign policy and regional foreign policies, all contribute to this. But they're all different, and they change all the time. And you know, we've seen circumstances where the United States was aggressive, and extremism grew. We've seen circumstances where the United States was more passive, and extremism grew. We've seen people employ hostile or aggressive foreign policies elsewhere and the reverse. And so it's very difficult, as we've proven throughout the course of today, to break anything down into one component. But you guys come from many, many different experiences and have seen some things work or have been frustrated by myths that are out there, like, in my mind, that one. Um, what are they? What's worked, Georgia? I don't know if I could just make one point of clarification that I think is going to be helpful for us as we move forward with this discussion, especially if we want to get into sp specific examples of what works and what doesn't work. And that is that um, we've been using the term counter-narrative in very different ways all morning. 
And you know, this whole field of CVE is beleaguered by jargon and, and conflated ideas. But I think it's really important that we make a distinction between the sort of alternative narrative that Farah just described or that Mr. Hadley referenced this morning in talking about identity, be it national, be it cultural, be it religious, an alternative identity versus counter-messaging or counter-narrative in a tactical sense, which is about poking holes in the doctrinal basis of a recruitment message or discrediting a, um, an extremist recruiter, which is a very different level of counter-narrative. And I, I think we need to be careful, especially if we're going to start talking in a, with evaluating sort of language about what works and what doesn't, that we, we're clear which kind of counter narrative we're talking about when we make that point. Do you think one works and one doesn't? I do. My personal opinion is that the first works and the second doesn't. <clears throat> I think that counter narrative as a tactic, if you're talking about poking holes in the doctrinal basis of an ideology, is not going to work to de radicalize someone. Because the reason, that's only the how of how they're recruited, it's not the why of why they're recruited. Well, I just, I, it, on that point, again, I'm not trying to promote conflict here, but really get clarification. But your suggestion earlier about using the media, I think you are getting more towards the second point of, 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 of countering their assertions, their, their propaganda. So I, I'm just wondering if you have a response to that. Oh, no, no. I think, you know, I think that we have seen over the last three or four years uh, this constant propaganda stream coming from groups like uh, ISIS, AQ, et cetera, that has worked in convincing, persuading uh, young people in the region, outside the region, to join groups like that. And I think, I don't know if there has been an equivalent effort that is indigenous to the region, uh, led by people in the region, to counter that propaganda. You know, we have extraordinary capacities when it comes to media. And I don't think it's been used. So I can't, I, I don't know if we can say it wouldn't. I mean, if, I, if I remember correctly, you said you disagreed with the second, uh, what, I, what I'm, I guess, agree, uh, uh, arguing for. But I don't know if it's not worked. An indigenous effort, substantive, sustainable indigenous effort to counter that propaganda. By the, but, uh, let me just throw one concept in here, which is uh, one that we bandied about back in the old days of the Clinton administration, which was the meta message. It's not the message that you speak, it's the message that's actually heard, you know, the one that's in the middle, and it's colored by a lot of things, not just words. So for example, if it's from local publications, if the source is different, it colors the substance of the message, and it might be received in a somewhat different way. And so I think, again, even within this, we need, we need to draw certain distinctions. Anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt. Did you want to respond briefly? Or? I think when we get into the discussion of reintegration of foreign fighters and de-radicalization, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of research there, evidence-based research that's rooted in sort of the psychology literature that actually shows that it's not the actual belief system that's for bringing people to engage in violence, that it's much more complex than that, and it's not just about the ideology. So I think we can get into that discussion of what works and what doesn't work in a very real sense once we start talking about de-radicalization and reintegration, and I hope Lorenzo and Tom will back me up on this because I think we, we both share a perspective on that as well. Will you? Uh, I do, of course. <laughs> I mean, I'm a guest here, so obviously. No, I wanted to talk a bit more about another issue that has come up a lot, okay. which is engagement with communities. Um, and I think one of the, the lessons that we have somewhat learned, I think particularly from a European perspective, is really that it's a neighborhood by neighborhood approach. I think if you look 10 years ago, most of the engagement was done with self-appointed gatekeepers to communities. There was sort of a laziness there in reaching out to the most visible and vocal voices, which were not necessarily uh, representatives of the community. And I think there, that has changed a lot. So it's done much more at the local level in a more proactive way. Uh, and that has given a lot of results, uh, which leads, though, to another point, which is how do you, and this is, goes for all kinds of CVE, whether it's the more strategic or the more tactical, how do you prove that what you're doing is effective, uh, if not counterproductive, uh, but also just, you know, that you're not squandering money if you're not actually making the problem worse. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult. Obviously, on disengagement, deradicalization is relatively easier. You, you'll, we'll see in Oros with this 25, 30 people if uh, uh, they're going to go back to militancy. But obviously, for more preventive measures, uh, 
it's very difficult. You have to prove a negative. You have to prove that what you're doing is preventing people from radicalizing. Uh, I think when it comes to engagement, there are ways of somewhat unempirically seeing that. Um, in Europe, that engagement started 10 years ago, more or less. Uh, 10 years ago, we had the mobilization for Iraq on a much smaller scale, but we had a few hundred people from Europe who went to fight in Iraq. I'm hard pressed to, find, to think of one example of somebody or some family that went to the police, went to intelligence agencies and said, my son is getting radicalized, my son went to Iraq, and so on and so forth. Now that's a very common dynamic. Uh, and I would argue that that movement of people that goes to authorities and seeks uh, uh, proactively, uh, in a way, some, in some cases, in a very frustrating way, because they don't understand why police cannot arrest people. So we know who the recruiters are, arrest them. And you have parents knocking on police doors and demanding arrest, something that you know, police cannot always do. Uh, for legal reasons, obviously. Um, but that dynamic has changed. And of course, it's difficult to prove the causation there. But arguably, the engagement that has been done, the, the tea drinking that a lot of people have sort of derogatorily called, has given some, some results. So obviously, it's a lot of the CV efforts, particularly in Europe, is you've got to prove results. You've got to prove the big budget that you're asking uh, is warranted by some results. And sometimes you see the results 10 years later. And that's obviously not the time frame that politics normally has. Well, you know, another thing that comes up as I listen to this is you use the term community, and it made me think about community policing, community policing as it took place in places like New York, and how, you know, now almost 20 years ago, they went from crime statistics that was reported on a monthly basis to crime statistics being reported on a daily basis. And so the consequence of that was that you were able to say after three days, that there was a crime wave instead of after three months and you were able to respond to it. And so it suggests that in these particular cases, collecting and sharing data very broadly in real time enables people to trace when an event pushes people towards radicalization, see where there's a little surge. And if you've got granular data it allows you to say, well, perhaps there's something there that's driving the surge and enables you to move it. And so there are kind of big data solutions to some of this stuff that might also be drawn from the, the, the policing that could actually be applied particularly more broadly between countries. Leanne. So one of the things that I found very useful in trying to think about the extremist phenomenon is actually to think about it through Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And that extremism plays onto all of the different hierarchy of needs, from the physiological to the safety to the love and belonging and esteem. And at different places, in, depending on what your needs are, is where extremism can fill that void. Part of the theory behind, I guess, a prevention agenda is that if more of those needs are met, then, it, then extremism will have a harder time making its inroads in those needs. But if the inroads have already been, been made into those needs, trying to then say that extremism is no longer the meter of those needs is a much harder case to prove. And I think this is what Georgia was saying a little bit along this, is that it, once the cycle of radicalization has already hit, it is much harder to just use the other knowledge, the 50% on the black and white spectrum, to try and convince off of it. So I'd maybe offer a little bit from a law enforcement perspective that could be useful which is the difference between your inchoate thoughts to a conspiracy, to a willingness to act, to an action, to a accountability. And if we're looking at extremism actions and the actual actions of individuals along that spectrum, then when you're trying to actually um, have some sort of rehabilitation for those who had the thoughts or the conspiracy or even the willingness to act, that that is different than those who have actually acted. And that's different from a level of accountability for those who have already taken those actions and possibly getting back into society. Society. So I think there's a lot that social science can really teach us about this field, and I think sometimes the, the militarized look at this prevents us from taking a true individual social science perspective. So I really hope that I get to play Al-Qaeda so I don't have to be constructive for the rest of the day, but I do hope that you know, we can think a lot more constructively about what you know, the last 50 years of social science can help us here. Thank you. Well, that was very out of character. <laughs> And, and constructive in the, in, the best, in the best possible way. Uh, we'll go Tom and then we'll go down, John. 
I think along those lines, I'd like to come back to a comment that David made earlier about the uh, inflection point between order and disorder in a society being a function of how many, how many people are willing to work in the system versus how many people are willing to work outside the system. Uh, and I think that uh, aligns nicely with Steve Hadley's views on, on civil society, even if it's not a perfect solution, and the Tunisia example clearly demonstrates that it's not. Civil society is frequently the, the best source of the alternate identities that we're talking about. It's the best way to keep people working within the system. And it is usually the source of the meta-narratives that you were uh, alluding to earlier. If, uh, those, those don't come from government at the end of the day. Those come from a, a deeper place, uh, and, and they come from civil, citizens and civil society. But in too many of the countries in the region, even if we had the perfect people and the perfect organizations wanting to organize those discussions, the environment is not conducive to that happening. And one of the things that I think all of us need to start thinking about is how do we create an enabling environment for that type of engagement? Because if we want to create an alternative, you have to create an alternative. And at the moment, in too many instances, there isn't uh, the foundation on which you can build that, uh, that counter-narrative or that counter-engagement. Now, you know, by, by the way, one of the points that you bring up here, which you know, is, is, is important, you were talking about uh, communities. And um, Tunisia, in the context of communities, is a generalization. You know, it's, it's too big because a lot of Tunisia works and, 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 and the foreign fighters aren't coming from a lot. They're just coming from communities. And so if you deal on a country by country basis, you'll be deceived by the generalization, right? Now I said Tom and I, there were a couple of them, so I'm gonna to go to you and then I'm gonna go down to you, John, okay. Um, I wanted to chime in a little bit on the social science side as well. And, and one of the, um, uh, the frames that I found tremendously useful is Louise Richardson's triple cocktail idea, not, not necessarily the specifics of her idea, but this idea of three buckets to think about, uh, almost a Venn diagram, if you will. Uh, one being the personal experience, it could be self-actualization in the Maslow model. Uh, one being the environment, that could be conditions conducive, but it could also be narrative. And then one being social networks, because it's difficult to join a terrorist organization unless you know someone in a terrorist organization. And once you start thinking about radicalization as having these, these three different sort of centers of um, sort of driver centers, if you like, I find it, it becomes a lot easier to start thinking about solutions. And of course, there's clearly no one solution that covers all of those three different areas. So I mean, it has to be creative and multifaceted. The other thing I just wanted to chime in on as well was community policing. And we've been pushing at the, the UN uh, community policing as a sort of a new big idea recently. And, and one of the big problems we, we often come across is it works terribly as a CVE idea. Right, if you're just turning up in the neighborhood and saying, we care about you now because we're worried about terrorism, that's exactly not how to do it. Community policing needs to be a policing response to community problems. It can't be a CVE thing. It can have a CVE benefit, but it's not going to have a CVE benefit if it's a CVE strategy. So this is kind of weird as well. So how do you have solutions to problems without even articulating that it's a solution to a problem? But actually with something like community policing, that might be the best way to go about it. It's a good, very good point. Uh, John. I think this is actually to link together a few of the different ideas that we've heard just in recently in this discussion about social sciences. I think you touched on big data being potentially part of the solution here. And then I think you touched on, uh, Georgia, the, the complexity of identifying why, um, why radicalization occurs. And I think given the typical background of participants in this sort of discussion, we tend to have very qualitative discussions about why a particular message works. Um, what message should we come up with that would counteract the, the message? We're very focused on the content. And I think to piggyback on some of the social science discussion, we're actually in a position where if we focus on people's actions, these are things that can be quantified. These are things that can be understood um, more at a structural level. I think it's actually possible in, as opposed to focusing on a solution without truly having identified the problem because it's too complex to articulate. Um, as opposed to imposing our concept of what a solution probably should be on top of a problem that we don't fully understand. I think with uh, a kind of science-driven um, understanding, I, th I think that the, the patterns that lead to um, the, the patterns of behavior, the patterns of communities, the patterns of, of societies that lead to 
um, the, either the probability of radicalization or an individual being radicalized actually will emerge from a research, a quantitative um, driven approach to understanding these problems as opposed to always coming back to this kind of, I, I don't want to say academic because I don't want it to sound like I'm being pejorative about academia. Um, you can't, go on, it's just among friends here. Yeah, <laughs> sorry academics. No, but I don't, I really don't mean that. What I, it's, uh, I, I think to avoid only looking at this through the lens of understanding the content and having this qualitative discussion about the relative worth of different types of words and different types of language, I think that there's actually a more fundamental pattern that we can understand with a more scientifically minded approach to recognizing the well, patterns. And I th look, I mean, this, this echoes things that we've talked about throughout. Soft plus hard, there is a whole spectrum. Social plus science, please, with the social science. <laughs> um, in other words, you know, data-based solutions, evidence-based solutions, as, as, as George was saying. So how, how many people are going to weigh in here? Okay, we've got about five, six minutes. So I'm really going to have to get into the, the 30 second to one minute response. I know this, it's not even possible for you, but go on, give it a shot. I'll go for 29 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> um, I second the, the whole data point. I'd love to see more geospatial mapping going down to a sub-regional and local level. And if we kind of interwove, had inter, were able to interweave with that, the reasons why people join, we could see why people are joining in, you know, whatever, southern Tunisia versus northern Lebanon. And I think that would be very, very interesting. Um, the other point I would just make, this is a discussion and it seems to be very fruitful on foreign fighters and counterviolent extremism. And we've got to be very careful that we don't conflate uh, what's happening overall in terms of extremism, particularly in parts of the world that are not ours in Western Europe and, and North America. In many parts of the world today and in the sub-regions, extremism is unfortunately too mainstream and we have genocidal, hateful ideologies that are very much at the core of mainstream clerical establishments, and those also need to be confronted. So when people are talking about narrative and, and broader-based campaigns, and Watts is talking about that from within, those are very important. They might not prevent necessarily the Danish person from a particular neighborhood or maybe some person from Minnesota going to fight for Shabbat, but we have a very endemic problem of extremism and significant groups where Al-Qaeda in Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria has broad-based support right now in many, many different ways in what they're doing. And if you had the attacks, I mean, I alluded to in my role as, as Syria, but take away what Bashar is saying. You know, in Eastern province in Saudi, when you had this attack, there's a lot of people who are denying that the attack actually occurred. And that the Shias, who, some, on Twitter, you see this is trending, that the, uh, some of the people are accusing the Shia pe people who, were, who died of precipitating the attack themselves in order to draw attention, uh, you know, et cetera. So I, I think we just have to also parse and, 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 and diagnose the different parts. Absolutely true. Uh, Mary. Um, as we were talking about civil society being um, important to, in the strategy, I, my question is looking at society or states where um, civil society has been clamped down on, especially since the uprisings. So what do we do there? Um, and especially when CV strategies actually used to continue to clamp down on civil society. Okay, Viola. Um, John's comment about us often having um, qualitative discussions here also made me think of kind of numbers and, and quantity. And I wonder about how the resources and energies and passions that we put into a lot of these efforts compare, if you were to quantify them, to the resources, energies, and passions that our ostensible adversaries are putting into this. I don't know whether any kind of measure of, of that has ever been attempted, but I think it'd be an interesting question. The other is something that a few of us were talking about last night, and that is that when we talk about the roots of, of some of this extremism, radicalization, the disenchantment, to, it's the precursor, part of that seems to stem from, go back to a, a, a phenomenon in transitional societies of where you have rule by the majority, but we're missing the other part of that that we sort of take for granted in, in a lot of Western thinking, and that is protection of the minority. 
So what if you were to, what if we were to emphasize, you know, rule by the majority, we talk about all the time, elections, et cetera, et cetera. We don't talk very much about the protection of the minority in whatever type of minority we're talking about, political, um, sectarian, whatever. I, I think it's an interesting question to look into. Philip, first. I'm going to try to speak to my strengths and not uh, talk about social science or anything else. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about my Shia groups. I, I find it very interesting if we're talking about myths and uh, I guess reasons for why there are these foreign fighters, no one's putting together that uh, after Nasrallah, Syed Hassan Nasrallah gave a speech in May 2013, this is when there was a huge jump in foreign fighters, Sunni foreign fighters, going to Syria. There's a sectarian issue here. It's a sectarian issue that's also being driven by another radical actor, which is Iran with its own uh, extremist ideologies. Uh, and if we're just going to kind of brush this out of the discussion and not even acknowledge that they're putting in foreign fighters, I mean, I, I saw on the map it said 900 from Lebanon, you know, excluding Hezbollah, uh, all 5,000 of them at various rotations, then we're running into a much bigger geopolitical problem. Okay, very briefly. And then I'll go to you. Just to build off that point, the proliferation of Shia, the Shia jihadist network is not only a threat to, to countries in the region, but also drives conflict on the local level, uh, speaking from the perspective of local insurgent groups. But just speaking out of the role, I would say that one of the underreported facets of the struggle is that we don't know to what degree there's community cover that is being built in the region, for example, in the areas of eastern Syria, where you have this large vacuum, social uh, social, demographic, and economic vacuum that's literally being served by various local actors in the grounds. And as that allows to be to, to root itself over time, that community cover has an effect. And without being uprooted, we'll be dealing with the same issue going forward and forward and forward. Thomas. Yeah, obviously these same kind of discussions and concerns are going and taking place within the countries of the region. And they're trying to struggle with how do they deal with the violent extremism. But I don't know that we are very linked up with those discussions, and I think we need to find a way to better link that, to encourage them, and in fact, the, the voice of, you know, the counter-narrative needs to come from the region, from Arab, from Muslim voices. And so we need to find a way first to link up and then to better support that. And then finally, there is a long-term issue here. I mean, we're trying to deal with something that we can do relatively quickly but we also have to deal with the long-term making governments more accountable in the region. And we can't sort of forget about that as well. Okay. Barbara. No. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, just I'm quickly, sorry. not, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to just, skip Yeah, over. sorry, very quick point. I think we have to be very careful, I think, particularly in the West, not to frame this as a CVE problem. You know, if we're doing, we need to be, do community policing among Somali communities in the suburbs of Minneapolis because it's the right thing to do, because we know what's, that, what's best, that that's the best method. If it's, well, we're going to do this because we don't want you to, to go to Somalia and join Al-Shabaab, rather than we want you to be integrated into the people of Minnesota, those are two very different frames. Okay. Sorry, Barbara. Yeah, just briefly, speaking as myself and not as Iran, um, I think that the well, I agree with Farah Pandit that this is a, something that is perhaps common to a lot of young Muslim millennials. Uh, we have ongoing conflicts that are focused in the Middle East that are serving as a magnet for foreign fighters. And uh, without efforts to actually resolve some of these conflicts, or at least diminish the level of violence in these places, we're not going to get a handle on this. And that means uh, the United States acting as a convener, as a mediator, if need be, uh, between different parties, uh, powers in the region, like Saudi Arabia and like Iran, that are feeding, feeding these conflicts. Uh, until we get a situation where the Saudi regime, where the UAE can sit down with the Iranians and, and talk about dialing this back, it's just going to get worse and worse. Okay. Amen. Uh, again, we're very we're a little over time here, so let's. Sorry to be the last one. No, but you're not. Uh, you're not. Oh, not yet. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm just going to build on a few points. I will not go too uh, too long. The problem that we've discussed, what I'm hearing around the table, has been quite a piecemeal approach. We do need a bottoms up and a top bottom approach to fighting extremism. And just as a, a small sort of solution. We have to, as you've mentioned, as a choking point for the supply chain for Daesh, at least in the short term, we have to acknowledge where the money is coming from. There are mechanisms 
from new technology and other forms to you know, stem the flow of the money. The arms, we have to have responsibility from the Western powers who have over-militarized the Middle East. We can just look at the numbers in the past few years, what's happening. And therefore, the arms uh, you know, procurement channels has to be choked in. We're talking about people crossing, people are the fighters who are going into these zones. How are they getting there? Again, comes to border control and again, the involvement of the Turkish uh, government to be more responsive to that. The most important point that I would like to bring up again is the ideological, because the ideological tendencies of Daesh provides justification for their actions. So here again, to stem it, there needs to be a, a bigger voice within the Islamic community to basically provide this um, more uh, varied uh, sort of perspective on Islam that Daesh has actually hijacked and has taken the most extreme form. Finally, on the PR campaign that uh, Daesh has been very, very good at, again, I think going to te the tech communication industry side, these are platforms that are run by the Western companies. And I think at this point, we need an international convention that brings in the United Nations to some extent, which provides sort of like a prevention of extremism online platforms. What are the measures? What are the ball points that, that can red flag these things? We've done it on the European continent in terms of, you know, anti-Semitism you know, Semitism or pro-Nazi propaganda. I'm sure we can achieve that on this basis. Throughout the day, I'll discuss on a more multi-track approach with varying timelines, because some of the measures are short-term, some have to be thought about in the future. What Daesh has provided this disfranchise and the disillusioned youth is a vision of the future. And that future vision, the communities and the governments in the region have not been able to provide to their disfranchised communities. So we need to think about a long-term vision for the Middle East, maybe possibly with more broader regional collaboration and dialogue that creates something like post-World War II um, sequences that resulted in European Union. Thanks. Think about that. Okay. Couple of, thank you very much. A couple of brief questions. Catherine. Okay. Very, very, quick, very, very quickly. Gender matters? Pardon me? Gender matters. We raised it at the very beginning of this, but we haven't then followed up through it. There's been an assumption, I think, implicit in some of the discussions that gender doesn't matter, but it really does matter. And that's not just about including women. It's about recognizing how masculinity comes into play, and it's about recognizing what forms of femininity and masculinity are being promoted, both by countering violent extremism narratives, but also by uh, extremist groups. Okay. Did you want to say... I think that um, listening to this conversation, we're confronted by multiple dualities. And, um, but I, I'm also struck by the last uh, several comments of um, a timeline. So for me, as I look at what's worked and what can work in the future, um, we know that the motives uh, for um, are there in terms of those who are, are um, attracted to um, Daesh or, or other radical uh, groups, faith, alienation, adventure, anger, personal crisis, all blended together. But I think what we're not doubling down on are, is the ecosystem. Farah um, and uh, a couple of others have really touched on this. That ecosystem is critical. It can be addressed if we put um, efforts into the, the economic, civil society and governance structure. It'll create some breathing space that will allow um, to, a, a re-engagement and not and close off some of the, the sources of radicalization. I'm struck by two countries, Jordan and Tunisia, and that's where you're seeing this pipeline. And I think that, um, again, we, we need a comprehensive approach and not a piecemeal approach. And we need to recognize this disparity between heightened expectations, uh, the job uh, and youth bulge, and the reality that with not so much effort, we can address that. So um, I think as we move forward throughout the rest of the day, maybe we can double down on some of the practicalities. Okay, Jim, did you wanna say something? You, you wait. Okay, great. Well, uh, I know what our agenda says, but I've actually done a conference before, and I know that if there is not a 10-minute break after the panel, after lunch, that can cause problems and distraction. Let me, let me leave it that way. So what I'm going to do is, pardon me? 
and mutiny. It can also cause a mutiny. So, so what I want to do is I want to give you 10 minutes. Please be very, you know, uh, 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 observant of that amount of time. Use it as best you can and return here in 10 minutes. Thanks very much. <laughs>